your dinner? <laughs> oh, I'm going to keep you waiting, I'm afraid. <laughs> oh, you've got a lot to get through. I'm going to talk about three things. We're going to have a very quick um, dash around the current economic situation. I promise it won't be long. Then we're going to talk about the uh, pulp fiction that was a recent budget. <laughs> I mean, crikey, what, what shenanigans that was. You know, the, uh, the tax guys take it all very seriously. It was just, um, oh, it was just, it was just, um, it was just politics and, and unaffordable. If you fall asleep in the next 10 minutes, that's all you need to remember. It's unaffordable. <laughs> and finally, we're going to have a little stroll down memory lane about previous times when Labour took power. And it's a bit I will enjoy because it was very easy. I didn't have to read any books or look up statistical tomes or anything like that. I've lived through it all. I can remember it. So that's all it takes. So um, hopefully it won't take too long. Um, if I overrun, just wave at me and I'll carry on talking. <laughs> <laughs> right, first slide, please. Good news. So you're glad I'm not here last You should be glad I wasn't here last year. Um, the news has got quite a bit better. The uh, global economy is definitely on the up. Global trade is expanding, albeit not very much. Uh, there is more growth than there was six months ago. Now, how do we know this? We look at all these uh, purchasing managers index PMI surveys. You don't need to look at these individually. They come out every day of the week. You look on the website and there's hundreds of the damn things. And individually, for each individual country, they're too small. The samples are often too small for comfort, shall I say. But if you aggregate them up to a global level, you do get something meaningful. And again, the, num the number itself isn't important. All we need to know is what all we need to look at is whether it's going up or down. And the good news in the last few months, it's been going up. So there is more growth around the world than there was six months ago. All right, China is still in a fat old mess. Um, parts of the EU are still not doing terribly well. Germany, France, and the Netherlands, to name but three. But if you want some bright spots, America's still going great guns. Big news this morning. The Japanese put up an interest rate. They've not raised interest rates since 2007. You know, first time. Um, they, they no longer have a negative interest rate. They're the, last, they're the last of the quantitative easers to come out of negative rates. And it was done this morning, and hardly anybody's noticed. <laughs> uh, if you want more good news, India, Indonesia, Mexico, places like that are all doing quite well too. So a mixed bag, but it's definitely better than it was six months ago. Next one, please. What's messed this up? Um, a couple of years back on the way out of COVID was firstly the fact that all our central banks got the inflation call badly wrong. I mean, how they could have all got it badly wrong, it just beggars belief, really. One of them, two of them getting it wrong would have been, would have been okay, but, but you know, the group think among them was so much, so great, that they all mistimed uh, the response to inflation. But the other thing, of course, that happened was, was the Ukraine war which put commodity markets into a spin. And so if you think in the UK that we got to an inflation rate of 10%, probably four percentage points of that was down to the Ukraine war. In other words, we still had a lot of inflation, but it wouldn't have been so bad. So this is still a critical thing. What's happening to commodity prices? Fairly flat. What's happening to gas and oil markets, especially what's, given, uh, what's going on in the, in the Red Sea? Yeah, reasonably calm. The oil markets have ticked up a bit in the past few days, up at 80s. Gas market's still okay. We are getting back to the sorts of levels for gas prices that we used to, to be familiar with. And indeed, I don't know about you, I, got, I, was, I was sat here early before this started, and I got an email from my energy provider saying that my direct debit's going down. It's not going down as much as I think it should, but you know, it is going down. So these, this, is, this is beginning to feed through to ordinary people and the amounts they pay for energy and certainly also to ordinary businesses. And so long as those markets remain calm, we stand a fighting chance of the global economic recovery continuing, maybe even 
gathering some pace. Next one, please. So what about here in the UK? Our long-awaited recovery. Now, the first thing to re remember is that this economy has not grown in two years. You get the monthly and the quarterly numbers and sometimes they're up and sometimes they're down and it's always a tiny little tiddly bit. But actually, this economy is no bigger in any way that you would notice than it was two years ago. I can think of times in my long memory when this economy has grown rapidly. I can think of times when it shrunk dramatically. I can't think of any time when it spent two years going absolutely nowhere. That's exactly what it's done. So we, so we surpass our pre-COVID economic size in late 2001, about the time of the Omicron um, debacle, and uh, in the next two, and the two years after that, we haven't gone anywhere at all. That's where we have got stuck. Now I'm hopeful, very hopeful, that that period has now come to an end. We apparently had growth in January, although I don't take too much notice of monthly GDP figures, and nor should you. Uh, we apparently had some growth in January. Our PMI surveys are looking a bit more wholesome. Inflation is coming down. Energy prices are coming down. People should be able <coughs> or more willing to spend their money as we go through the course of this year. So I am looking for growth. <coughs> I'm looking for it to get moving as we go through this year. It will take a bit of time. The economy's supply capacity is still a bit tight, um, principally on account of the labor market. So I'm looking at growth rates this year, rising to about 0 0.4, 0 0.5 a quarter, up to 0.7 a quarter by the end of next year. Well, that gives us 0.6% growth this year, 2.2% growth next year. And we haven't had 2% growth since 2017. So it will be a bit of a first. But bear in mind one other thing. Our population, as we know, is growing rapidly. Not because we're making lots of babies or because we're living a lot longer, it's because we're getting lots of migration. A lot of them are students, but you don't quite know when they're going to go. So what we've got in the short term is a very big increase in our population. Population in 2022 rose by 1%. It hadn't done that since 1962. And the increase in 1922 was a lot bigger in human terms than the one in 1962. So in actual fact, we've all got poorer. Because GDP per head fell in 2023. It will probably fall in 2024 as well. So bear that in mind. Uh, yeah, it, it's likely to be the end of this year, start of next year, before we start to see an increase in per capita GDP. Next one, please. Why has all this happened? Essentially, we battened down the hatches. Now, I know we've had a cost of living crisis. Crikey, you couldn't get away from it, could you? That's finished. That finished six months ago. And people still talk about it. The thing is, that isn't the reason why our economy hasn't grown. I mean, first thing you'd say if I said to you the economy hasn't grown, oh, cost of living crisis. It's not that. I mean, poor export performance doesn't help. Brexit and all the rest of it. The government's <laughs> retreating from some of its pandemic and energy support programs. That doesn't help either. But the real reason this economy didn't grow last year is because consumers, households, up down the land, you, me, decided off our own volition to save more money than we've ever saved in the past 30 years. Normally, we would hold, in recent years, we would hold back, say, 3 to 4% of our income not spend it on current spending. We do other things with it. We might buy houses with it. We might, we might pay down debts. We might put it in the bank as deposits. We might do all of those things with it. But we hold back three to four percent. Suddenly last year, cost of living crisis, you might think what we would do, what we do to get around it is to say, okay, just for this year, I'll save two percent. No, we decided to save six. And that's what made the difference. The difference between the 4% we saved in 2022 and the 6% of our incomes we saved in 2023 is about 30 billion. Wouldn't the shopkeepers and the hospitality venues love to have seen that? 
Oh, we didn't take it down there and spend it. We stuck it in the bank and we sat on it. And the big question is why? You know, for, the, for a decade before 2008, that ratio would not have been 6%. It wouldn't have even been four or three or two. It would have been negative. And suddenly we want to save 6% of our incomes. I can see if you're about to re refinance your mortgage, you would definitely want to save more. That's only 2 million out of about 29 million households. I can see that if you've got a mortgage full stop, you might want to save more. You might now be realizing after your mortgage is run about seven years and has got 23 to go, that actually the last, the last 23 are never going to be as cheap as the first seven. That might be changing some of your plans. Uh, the kids may not be going horse riding and some of those swimming lessons might get canceled and all the other things. And, uh, and hubby won't be allowed to go on his golf trip to Portugal, uh, which is apparently a networking, you know, darling. All that sort of thing. Some of this, no doubt, is being pulled back on and stopped. But that's still only 10 million households. Why are the other 19 million saving so much? And I have to say, I'm a bit mystified because I don't really see any explanations for this. I can think of two. One is inflation. We haven't seen it for a long time. It frightens us. We think we need to save more. Normally, the reaction to inflation is you spend more. You know, you know, the, the, the Germans who wheeled their wages home in, in wheelbarrows in 1923 didn't take it home and put it in the bag, did they? They spent it before it lost value. But our inflation, all right, it's been bad, but not that bad. What we've tended to think is, oh, we better make up for that inflation by saving a bit more. Rather than letting it eat away at my savings, I'll, put, I'll, save, I'll save more so it catches up with inflation. That seems to be what we've done. The other thing I suspect we've realised, and it's come as a bit of a shock, is that energy costs can go through the roof very quickly. I don't think it would have been in many of our calculations before 2021 too, that your energy costs could double, triple, quadruple in a matter of a few months. The government spent 94 billion, you worry about R&D tax credits, Government spent 94 billion on mitigating the impact of that on ordinary on, on people and businesses. Um, and what it meant is that the prices we paid, the amount we, we spent, just about doubled. Um, we got through it because we used less. If we hadn't used less, it would have been an increase of about two and a half times. And had been for the government, it would have been an increase of about four times. Now that's probably come as a bit of a shock, and that might have that might well have got people um, desiring to save more. But I have to confess, it's a bit of a mystery, and it's really important because if we continue to save six percent of our incomes next year, you won't get that two percent growth I was predicting. You will not. That figure needs to fall, and how far that fall, how deep that fall is, whether it goes back to four percent, three percent, or even lower. How steep that fall is will determine largely how much this economy grows in the next few years. Next one, please. What is holding us back in the short term? I mentioned it earlier, it's a labor market. It's still far too tight. I know some of our labor market figures are in a mess. Don't take any notice of unemployment, a lot of the other numbers you see. There's a new survey being dredged up. It will be ready in September. In the meantime, in the meantime, just watch the wages numbers and the vacancy count. The vacancy count is still too high. It's 900,000. It needs to be down to about 800,000 before I can be reasonably confident that the labour market is functioning normally. We'll get there. The question is how long it takes. So tomorrow we'll see the inflation numbers. They're going to fall and it might be about 3.5% and everybody will be thinking, Oh, interest rate cuts around the corner, inflation coming down. Don't look at that number, it doesn't matter. The one you need to watch is the core rate that excludes energy and food. That figure was 5.1 last month. That one needs to come down as well. The next one, please. When do we get rate cuts? I reckon I'm going for August, and I think we'll get two. Um, but markets often price aggressively on this and price ahead. 
and often get carried away. Don't be caught up in their exuberance. So I think two base rate end of this year, 4.75, uh, and, and a gradual further, further reduction in 2025. Next one, please. But how this can mislead people is seen by what happened in November, December. The markets got all exuberant that there were going to be big rate cuts imminently. And all the banks went and cut their mortgage rates, which are priced off those swap rates that you see on the charts. But it was all frost, it was all, it was all exuberance. They weren't listening to what the central banks were saying. They were thinking what they were hoping, you know, they were hoping that, that what they wanted would come true. And what you've now seen is mortgage rates going higher. Because the, mark, because the banks and the others jumped the gun. Those swap rates have gone up in January and February. They've not come down in March. So mortgage rates will go down, but it won't be a straight line, and it even matters to the government. It raised some 20-year money this morning, and it paid more than it paid last time. It raised 20 years money, and that's not good. So there you go. An economy that's primed for growth, but don't get over-eager about the rate cuts. They're going to take some time. It's going to take some time to get in core inflation down because we're not going to get core inflation down until the labor market loosens. Deep breath, next one. The fiscal fiction, oh dear me. <laughs> I'm really not going to spend much of this much time on this because it is really complete and utter nonsense. Um, you know, this is what passes for a fiscal rule. Um, I will do a load of sums and build a load of spreadsheets such that in five years' time, the burden of debt to GDP is falling. I'm never held accountable for it because, it, because, the, because the horizon always moves. So we're now looking at debt to GDP having to fall in 2028 to 29. What happened in 2027, 28, which was the target for last year, is now of no interest whatsoever. All that matters is that you can, you can dredge up a forecast that has it falling in five years' time. You don't need to be spreadsheet Phil or even spreadsheet Rishi. And apparently he's very good at his spreadsheet. He's really good at his spreadsheet. He's probably done all the budget sheets on his own. You don't even need to be that good to make this work. All you need to do um, is to make some hairy assumptions about public spending in non-ring fenced areas after the current spending review. A 12-year-old could do it. Maybe a 12, maybe, maybe Jeremy Hunt's daughter does it, I don't know. She plays the piano, I know that. Because um, um, the piano is downstairs in, the, um, in number 11 Downing Street, because apparently they want, the removal men wanted, wanted 3,000 quid to get it up the stairs. So, so it's downstairs, and that's where his daughter plays the piano. Or perhaps she did his spreadsheets for him in the spare time. Um, so it's utter nonsense. <coughs> the debt burden continues to rise. It goes to over 90% of the GDP. And on the internationally acceptable measure of comparing one country to another, which is gross government debt as a percentage of the GDP, it's actually under 100. Next one. So they do think the annual budget deficit is going to fall and hit their secondary target in a couple of years that it should be under 3% of GDP. Um, that's not a lot to write home about. Um, it's going. It, it's, it's going to fall a lot further than that. They've still. They've still got it. They've still got it at one percent at, at the end of the forecast period. If government is going to invest in the things this country needs, the infrastructure and so on and so forth, not not and and, and of course the defence spend, it's going. It's it's going to. It's going to have to do some decent capital spend, and given the interest um, cost as well, I suspect we're going to need in the medium term to be running some, some substantive current deficits, i.e. day-to-day spend. Um, there's no sign that that's happening yet. Next one, that's our debt service, that's what it costs. Um, now, that's about 60% of what we spend on the NHS. <coughs> and it's more that we spend on an awful lot of things. It's not more than we spend on, on pensions. I'll show you that one later. But it's a very big element of spending. Um, it's also extremely sensitive to interest rates, which is you know, what the government has to pay on this debt. 
and also that old fashioned retail prices index, which determines the cost of servicing the index for gilt. And in hindsight, we probably issued a few too many of those, a few less of those, and a few more standard ones might have been a good idea. Next one. So this is what it comes down to, isn't it? How much were all taxed? Highest tax burden since the 1940s. And you might think the 1940s was all about Clement Attlee, grey Britain, rationed post-war, cradle to grave socialism. Wasn't, well, it was, well, it was about the war. The reason the tax burden was so high is that Mr. Attlee was spending over 10% of GDP on defence. Bear in mind, we now struggle to spend 2%. Arguably, he lost the 1950 election because he was spending too much on defence, too much on guns and not enough on butter. So it's going to go to 37% by the end of this period. Labour's big question is where can that be long term? I have to tell you, it could go quite a lot higher without doing serious damage to our economy. You can look at economies around the world that have seriously higher tax burdens. They might not be as dynamic as the United States, but they're still pretty good places to live. Scandinavia to start with. So I doubt they'll do that, but there would be scope. Now, it does not have to go back to 32, 33% of GDP. Um, last one in this section. This is more, this is more throwaway. Everybody was talking about tax earlier. This is how we're taxed. You can see the biggest, can't you? This is the ones that people notice. Income tax, national insurance, VAT, there's the one people, they're the ones people notice. They're the really big numbers. You fiddle around with them. You can raise a lot of money, or it can cost you a lot of money, but people will notice. Uh, there's a whole heap of ways the government raises money that, that would take about five charts to put on. And most of them are most of them are fairly raise fairly minimal amounts. Um, the big one I suggest they will think about is fuel duties. Government's first speaker right at the start talked about leaving money on the table by not indexing fuel duties to inflation and making a conscious decision each year not to do so. The government has left 90 billion on the table. Uh, yeah, I know motorists are quite keen on it, but that's a lot of money to leave on the table. And I think the labor, I think Labour will be after some of that. That's that that to my mind is the easiest pickings is to stop is to stop freezes on fuel duties. So there we go. Oh one more, sorry, one more. This is what's this is what's happening to us. The miracle of fiscal drag. Um, Jeremy Hunt is often called, you know, the, the, drag, the, the fiscal drag queen, isn't he? For all his, uh, the, the degree that this has been done to us the last couple of years. In the old days, and you, might, and you might not remember this, in the old days, these allowances all went up with inflation, and it wasn't really much of a story. They just went up with inflation. And suddenly they don't. But suddenly this gives you, this gives you political scope to announce some real big tax wheezes and tell people that you're cutting their taxes, but actually they're just increasing less quickly than they would otherwise. You could have done, you could have achieved the same by fiddling around with the tax thresholds. Uh, the result is over this forecast period, we've got 2.7 million more people who will be going, who will be in the 40% band, and another half a million who will be dragged into the 45% band, partly because they changed, because they changed that threshold um, last autumn statement, I think it was. So there we go, that's what they're doing to us. Fiscal, fiscal, a big exercise in fiscal drag, and it's that that will get that tax burden to 37%. Now for memory lane. Next one, please. Since the Second World War, we have had 21 general elections. Don't remember all of those, by the way. We have had nine changes of government, and I count in those changes involving coalitions. So I'm counting 1945, when Labour took over from a, a wartime coalition, and I'm counting 2015, when the Tories took over from a Lib Dem coalition. So nine changes of government since the war. But they have been very rare in the last 40 years. So since the last 40 years, we've had 1997, 2010, 2015. 
and since 2015 was only a coalition change, really we've only had two. So we're not used to them, they are now in frequency. If you go back to the, the, to the 60s and 70s, we would have had one, we'd have had four changes of government in under 20 years in the 1970s. Now we've had two in 40 years. So they are, they have definitely got rarer. Next one, please. Has it made any difference the way our economy grows? No. Everybody gets terribly feared of a new government and the skids are going to fall off and all the rest of it. By and large, they don't. The thing keeps on growing. The economy grows through factors that are much bigger than a change of government. It often grows because of things that governments did 10 years ago, not, not what it did 10 minutes ago. Um, the strongest decade of growth marginally was the 1960s over the 1950s. But the big news is that the rate of economic growth has fallen markedly since 2008. So if you take our GDP growth, you take it from 1950 up to 2008, and you draw a trend line through it at 2.5%, you will get a precise match. In other words, there are times in that period when it goes above, and there are times when it goes below, but it always come back, and it was back on course at 2.5% in 2008. <clears throat> and ever since then, it's gone horribly wrong. Trend rate of growth, growth since then is probably somewhere between one and one and a half. It's, it's, it's an absolutely horrible change. It's got nothing to do with the politicians, try as they might. This is, this is something that's, that's much too big for them. So what happened on the various uh, previous Labour incarnations? Let's start with, next one please, the 1960s. Harold Wilson's white heat of technology. Any of you remember Harold Wilson? He wore a Mac, he smoked a pipe. He was an Oxford Don. Um, and actually, he was, um, he was a proper economist. He's probably the only prime minister we've ever had who was a proper economist. I'm not sure that helped him. <clears throat> we still had to devalue the pound three years later. But we might have had to do that anyway. What he did is he wanted growth. So we had, we, had, we had sorts of planning mechanisms put in place that go beyond any attempts we've had recently at industrial strategy. We had a national economic development plan, a national economic development council, and all sorts of infrastructure and architecture around that. For a couple of years, it seemed to work. And then we had the devaluation, de it got a bit horrible, and then it worked quite well again. So it came as a bit of a surprise to everybody, not least to Harold, when he got kicked out in 1970. The 60s was a decade of very low employment, because that was, that was, that was what we targeted in those days. That was the economic anchor, full employment. It was a period of rising inflation. Labour failed to get on top of this. Um, not only were British firms, that were, not only was their long-term lack of compat competitiveness internationally becoming... Um, somewhat obvious, but, our, but the trade unions were getting rather high and mighty. So we ended the decade uh, with, with decent growth, but with quite a lot of inflation. So they won in 64, they won again in 66, kicked out in 1970. Next one, please. Now this is the horror show, the 1970s. I have to tell you, the 1970s were absolutely great. It just doesn't look great when you look at the stats. <laughs> Um, the economy went from boom to bust. We had the barber boom, conservative chance in the first few years of the decade. He you know, racked it all up a, 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 a notion called competition and credit control, which uh, freed up the banks to lend money and all sorts of things. There was a market where there was certainly some competition. There wasn't any credit control. We ended up with all the secondary banks in some secret Bank of England lifeboat within a couple of years. So it went horribly wrong. Uh, and it was going horribly wrong before the, uh, before the Yom Kippur War in 1973. Uh, we then had a minor strike, we had a three-day week. Everybody quite liked a three-day week, actually. Um, why would you not? Um, <clears throat> in the end, it didn't last very long. Um, Ted Heath, the sort of most wet fish of wet fish politicians you could ever imagine. Um, just watch the video, you'll know what I mean. Um, he called an election he didn't have to call. I don't know whether he thought it would really help him with the unions, it might. He called an election. Mercifully, the campaign was only three weeks. Uh, we don't get three-week campaigns now. The law precludes it. 
We had a three-week campaign. Everybody thought he would win, including Labour. He lost very narrowly. So in March 74, you have a new Labour government. Labour has drifted to the left. It wasn't expected to win. It, apart, from, apart from buying off the miners, it hasn't the foggiest idea what to do. Because he's not been thinking about it. He's going to think about it later that year. And suddenly you're in government. <coughs> well, it was all fairly chaotic. And eventually it was decided that we would borrow our way through. That worked well. We were going to borrow our way through because we had a social contract with the trade unions. Well, Labour tried to stick to its end of the bargain. The trade unions did not. Within, eight, within 15 months, we got 25% inflation. And a year after that, the IMF was in, um, giving, a, giving us a bailout. The bailout, of course, was then the means by which Labour finally got control of the trade unions and its finances. The late 70s wasn't too bad until the unions messed it up again for them. So this was definitely the decade of inflation. <clears throat> Unemployment still reasonably low throughout most of the 70s, and so that does creep up towards the end. And then the last one, 1990s, this was entirely different. This is Labour kicking out a rather tired Tory administration. John Major lost his majority in Parliament, cash for questions, squabbling about Brexit. Well, in those days it wasn't Brexit, but it was, it was anything EU. He had a Eurosceptic wing. These are the ones he called the bastards when he, was, uh, when he thought he wasn't on microphone. Um, so we go from, from Black Wednesday, the day we get shunted out of the European exchange rate mechanism, which was Nigel Lawson's idea, and a bad one anyway, um, <clears throat> to Tony Blair's first few years in power, which were reason, which were really something quite different. This was called Britannia. The, <clears throat> the economy seemed to refine its mojo. It grew by 3% plus for four straight years. And it's come nowhere near to doing that any time since. Um, it's the first internet age. And as a result, when the world did go into a bit of a meltdown in 2001, the UK's fiscal position was so strong, we were able to ride it out. I used to do presentations with slides titled Surviving the Crunch, because we did all the 2001, two stuff, dot com bust. It didn't matter here, because we were fiscally strong, our economy was growing strong, and so on and so forth. Phew. We like that again. Here we are instead in 2024. And whoever wins this next election will have a poison chalice they probably wish they really weren't going to get. A debt burden of near on 100% of the GDP and an economy that hardly grows at all. An economy that has underinvested for years um, and with all sorts of other big issues to face. How on earth do you get it to grow? How on earth do you make the public finances stack out? Two last things just to look at very quickly. First one, welfare spending. How much can we afford to spend on welfare? Currently spending over 10% of GDP. That's projected to rise to over 11 and 300 billion quid. Can we afford that much? Over half of that is pensions. What do we do about the retirement age? What do we do about the triple lock? And what do we do about, about the various social security benefits? But bear in mind, if you take people, you take money off the poorer people in society, you lose spending power. These people will reliably spend pretty much all the money you give them. You give the money to the middle class and the little blighters will go and save it, which is frankly next to useless. So be careful what you do down at the bottom end. Second, next one. Um, we need to increase the size of the workforce. And yes, it's, it's tied in with the previous one. And we've had new projections from the OBR at the time of the budget. At the, just on the, on, on the eve of COVID, 64% um, of people of working age were in work. That number's fallen since and nobody thinks it's going to get back to 64%. It really does need to. More people working is more, you know, more productive capacity for our economy, increases our supply potential. It means employers don't have, to, don't have to turn to inward migration to quite the extent they have been. But it's going to be difficult. 
it's over 9 million people in that category. Now, a lot of it is, is fair dues. That includes the students. You know, students can work a bit. My son does his weekends in Morrison's, doling out hot chickens to uh, football dads and uh, all the rest of it. Um, there are people who that you know. There are people who don't need to work and, and can idle away without being a burden on the state. Absolutely fine if, if you're lucky enough to be in that position. There are people who make a conscious decision to stay at home, bring up bring up uh, bring up kids, look after look, look after relatives. Absolutely fine. Problem is, it's quite costly when you get five million people on benefits of one sort or another, and that is going to be is going to be have to have to be challenged. And I suspect, actually, only a Labour government can do it. There are certain things that only one party can do because there's so much, you know, the, the, the other one gets, gets, in a, gets grief if they go into these areas. The Tories would find it very hard to go into these areas. The Tories would find it very hard to do anything about the NHS. Labour is probably the only one of the major parties that, that, can, that, can, get, that can have a go at getting to grips with, with the size of the welfare state and the amount we spend on the NHS. But if we're going to get the public finances into any sort of meaningful order, we're going to have to do both of those in the years ahead. So finally, that's one. That's me. If you liked what you heard, you know, I'm, uh, I'm available for hire. I get bored sitting around in Hampshire, so, you know, up for, up, for as, up for as much as this as anybody could throw at me. And to sum up where we are, an economy that really should recover this year. The days of zero growth are now behind us. But it won't be dramatic. We will still be constrained by those labour market shortages for some time to come. And it is going to take a while to get interest rates back down. It's not going to happen overnight. And it's often not going to happen as fast as financial markets think. Whenever you, whenever you, whenever you hear all this analysis out of, uh, out of clever people in the financial markets about when rates are going to be cut, don't think of them as being very clever. Just think of them as being spoiled kids at a six-year-old's birthday party, trying to get their hands back into the sweetie jar of cheap money. They've been in one heck of a strop for the past 18 months, two years because some responsible adult finally turned up and took the candy jar away. The cheap money went and the interest rates went up. The thing is, back in December, one of the little blighters thought, thought they'd seen the jar being carried down the street outside and got all excited it was coming back. Message, it's not coming back. Thank you very much.